right, well, welcome. It is so lovely to see all of you here at the Community Crisis Food Bank. Um, thank you. First, I want to thank Crystal, who was my co-conspirator in this. Um, when I called her and I said, hey, can we host this in your food bank, she did not immediately tell me no. <laughs> she entertained the idea, and so somehow we've been able to pull this together. But I felt it was really important for all of you to be in this space uh, so you could see it and you can understand uh, what it looks like and um, who the people are that um, both utilize this service and also uh, work behind the scenes to make an operation like this work. So thank you so much, Crystal, and tr to your staff for helping us make this happen. So um, I also want to thank all of you. Many of you in this room today are our leadership level donors. And so what that means is that you give $1,000 or more, or more per year um, to the United Way um, so that we can support 30 partner agencies in our community that are doing um, the important work of making sure that nobody is left behind. So thank you so much to our leadership level donors. We really appreciate you as well. And last but not least, I want to thank our sponsors for this event. Uh, Bread Garden Market is always uh, a partner with us for food and coffee. They are just the best. And then I also want to thank Barb McFadden and Tom Rocklin for helping sponsor this event as well, too. So, and they are here. <laughs> So um, with that, what I would like to do is just quickly introduce um, our panelists. And um, I'm not going to go too deep into their background because you're going to hear about their expertise as we kind of travel throughout this event today. Um, I felt um, very disheartened when I saw the news about um, the, the food uh, federal aid for the summertime and I kept wondering what does that mean for our community specifically and I thought well if I'm worried about it maybe our donors and our partners are worried about it as well too so I thought instead of me just sitting in my office worrying about this let's have an event and we can talk about it and really understand what is the scope of the issue and how can we as voters as um, citizens in this community as donors what can we do um, to help support children and families this summer who are facing food insecurity. So with that, John Bowler is the executive director of the Coralville Community Food Pantry, and he's a board member of the Iowa Hunger Coalition, so he has just a ton of expertise for us. Um, Rachel Carr, uh, on the end here, Community Services Manager at Johnson County Social Services. Um, she is working in a, lot, in a lot of different areas, food insecurity being one, housing is another. Um, Allison Demery, Director of Nutrition Services for the Iowa City Community School District. Um, and she has a really awesome recipe for cherry oatmeal <laughs> cookies. So just so you know, don't leave here without it. And then we have Krista Cabela, um, Crystal, I'm sorry, Food Bank Manager at at the Community Crisis Food Bank. So with that, thank you, yes, give it up. These are the folks that are doing the hard work of making sure that our community is well fed. So with that, John, I'm gonna ask you the first question here. Um, you are the executive director and also very involved in the Iowa hum Hunger Coalition. Um, so you are a leader in addressing food insecurity issues for over a decade. Um, and I wanted to kind of start with questions for you about, like, can you frame up the kind of the challenge? Tell us about the challenges that you're seeing in this, in this world right now. Sure, yeah. From a more policy perspective? Yes. You think? Okay, yeah. absolutely. So can everybody hear me okay? Cool. Um, Thank you so much for hosting this conversation. This is really, really important. I just want to start by saying hunger um, 
certainly doesn't exist in a bubble, and I think all of you in this room know that. There are root causes that impact hunger, um, and we're all committed here to addressing those root causes. They're multifaceted, and I think our solutions need to be multifaceted as well. Um, for a long time, you know, our, our approach has been we have a, a public sector approach to the issue of hunger and a private sector approach as well, um, and they've worked in tandem pretty well. And lately, I think the theme today will be um, the private sector certainly pulling its weight and is, is overwhelmed at the moment um, as there's been a lot of changes to our, our public safety net. Um, for a long time, I think we've described our work at food pantries, food rescue organizations, other nonprofits at the local level, whether it's United Way, HACAP, uh, Table to Table. Um, the work we're doing is kind of more of a band-aid, uh, just kind of addressing those emergency needs that exist on the superficial level, knowing that there's so much underneath that uh, needs to be worked on, but the most we can do is just address, okay, this family needs food, and we'll refer them to another resource to get those other needs taken care of, which again, through our United Way network, we have so many incredible nonprofits offering those types of services. Um, I think a more apt metaphor nowadays, especially in the past three, four years, um, food pantries especially, it feels like we're not so much a Band-Aid, but more of a tourniquet. Uh, just because the wound is so deep, so complex, so severe, um, more than ever before. Food pantries, as you'll hear from Crystal, food pantries in our community and across the state are breaking records every month. Uh, we're seeing more visitors than ever before. At the Coralville Food Pantry, we just learned through our member survey that 80% uh, of the folks who visit us for food consider us to be their primary food source. So they get 50% or more of their food from their food pantry. And that's common in Iowa City and other parts of the community. Um, so today I want to just kind of zoom out a little bit, and I'll try to be as brief as I can, uh, just to kind of talk a little bit about how public policy is impacting what we're seeing on the front lines. And again, this is coming more from my lens as a board member with the Iowa Hunger Coalition, which I certainly urge you all to, to learn more about and get involved with. It's a 501c4 nonprofit that's really invested in using policy as a, as a means to addressing those root causes of hunger. So uh, I want to talk about SNAP, which you're probably familiar with. So again, painting the picture here, we're seeing record breaking numbers at food pantries, but a program like SNAP, which is probably our best tool in our toolkit when it comes to addressing uh, the issue of hunger, um, enrollment in SNAP in Johnson County is at a 14 year low. And statewide, it's at a 16 year low. In Johnson County, there's just reported, I think last month, uh, close to 4,400 total households in the county who utilize SNAP. Uh, just to, again, paint another picture for you, at Coralville, in the last 12 months, we served 4,200 people. So in the county, there's only 4,400 families utilizing SNAP. And I would imagine between Community and North Liberty and Hills and Icy Compassion and Coralville, we're serving close to maybe 15,000 or so households. So clearly, that safety net program is not reaching everybody who needs it. And you might wonder, like, why, why is that the case? Uh, a lot of it's due to just some el eligibility changes, limited benefits, uh, the re-enrollment process is kind of challenging, and there's been some work uh, requirements instituted for folks who are considered able-bodied and independent, just making it challenging. The average benefit per person per meal is about $1.89, which doesn't go very far. Um, and there's been some other changes to the SNAP program, especially at the state level, through Senate File 494, which was introduced last year in 2023 and signed into law, which introduced an asset limit for folks who apply for SNAP. So that means if you have maybe an additional vehicle or a savings account that you're using to try to get out of poverty, uh, that counts against you when you're applying for that program and you might not be eligible. Um, it also included some new electronic verification processes that are just more complicated. And our estimation at the Hunger Coalition was that, that that bill alone would have kicked off about 50,000 people across the state. Uh, the good news is our incredible Health and Human Services Department at the state level doing so much amazing work, they don't have the bandwidth to implement that bill right now. So right now it's just kind of on pause. So we're, we're breathing a sigh of relief but knowing that it could be implemented in the next year or so. Uh, as uh, Jenny mentioned, Summer EBT, you've probably all heard about that. It's been a long-standing program that's been in existence since 2011, I believe, but more uh, implemented at the federal level, um, starting with the pandemic. And it was called Pandemic EBT. It's a childhood nutrition benefits program that ensures that kids during the summer who were eligible for free or reduced lunch meals, they get access to just financial benefits of $40 per kid per month. So a total of $120 for that family to support each kid in their 
household uh, to make sure it's a supplemental program so the kids have access to the food they need to thrive. So it's again, it's intended to complement all the other existing USDA summer food service programs, everything else that exists, uh, not replace them. So, and you, you heard our, our state famously turned down uh, $29 million of funds. We were one of 12 states in the country to do so for, for 2024, even though we, were, we did opt in the past three or four years. Um, and so the impact of that is there's close to 250,000 kids who would be eligible in the state of Iowa who will not have access to those benefits this summer. And you'll hear from Allison about the incredible work that school districts are doing to make sure there's summer lunch sites available. Uh, and we do commend the governor and the Department of Education for um, allocating $900,000 in grant funds to support new summer lunch sites to again kind of cover as many of those areas as possible to make sure kids get access to food. Uh, sadly, the news is there's I think 320 some school districts in the state of Iowa. More than half of those districts do not have a summer lunch site. So that means there's at least 45 to 50,000 kids who are eligible in those districts that won't have access to any summer meal benefits this coming summer. Um, so filling that gap is really important. Allison at the Iowa City Community School District is working her tail off to make sure we're covered in Johnson County and there's still some gaps that she'll talk about, but most communities in Iowa don't have that resource. It's really hard. We host a summer lunch program in Coralville. You need a school district supporting you. You need uh, private partners. We have to have restaurants helping out. We need volunteers. You need a host site. It's a lot. It's a heavy lift and it's really challenging, for, especially for rural communities. Um, and then I'll, I'll try to wrap up soon. This is a lot. I apologize. Uh, the farm <laughs> bill, which I was talking to someone earlier, it's it's an exhaustive bill that I will not pretend to know everything about. It's, it's very intimidating, but it's mostly ag-centric, but there is pieces of nutrition legislation in that bill. Um, and that's up for discussion here. Both the Senate and the House at the federal level have created some framework to talk about what they want to see in that. Uh, we're concerned at the House level they've made a proposal to adjust some uh, funding um, implements that would impact SNAP, TFAP, commodity foods. Um, so the Thrifty Food Plan, you've never probably heard of this, it's kind of an obscure formula uh, that's used and modified every few years to calculate what the average family of four needs to purchase like consistent, healthy, adequate food um, at just kind of a basic financial level and that's used to inform like how allocations are made for SNAP um, and other programs and we had a big boost to that a couple years ago during the pandemic. Uh, this house framework would freeze any future adjustments to that formula for the next 10 years. Um, and our estimates is that that would cost, we would lose about $30 billion in SNAP benefits over the next 10 years, which would reduce the average household's benefits by about $70 per month. So clearly that's a problem. Another thing that really impacts food pantries and food banks would be how that would impact the commodity food program. So you might have heard of uh, government milk, government cheese, those sort of commodity foods it's a great safety net program to ensure that every food bank and every food pantry in America has food. It's purchased from farmers and distributed to folks who have food insecurity. Um, so through that adjustment to the Thrifty Food Plan, there would be cuts to that program as well. I don't know for community's sake, but for the Coralville Food Pantry, those commodity food items which we get for free, they're, they're incredible. High, high quality proteins, fruits and vegetables, grains, canned, canned foods. Uh, that makes up probably close to 30% of our food source. So that would be a huge hit to us as we're again, we're seeing historic rates. So again, I'm sorry, that was such a long answer, but thank you for getting through that with me. I, I think the theme today is just how do we strengthen our public safety nets when our private safety nets just completely maxed out. So thanks for listening. No, John, I think that was a really wonderful high level view of how public policy really does at the federal level really does trickle down to the local level. So thank you for that. I, I, I learned a lot. So I hope you all learned a lot too. So Crystal, um, this f uh, food pantry is the largest pantry in Johnson County um, and it serves folks, you know, near and far. I know you have a mobile, um, mobile uh, food delivery and um, all kinds of different ways Ways that you are supporting people. So my question for you is, um, can you tell us about the space that we're in right now and who you serve? Sure. So we, um, we moved into this building during COVID because we needed more room. Our original space was very, very, very small. And in order to allow people to choose their own items, um, we had to have more space. And it turned out to be a really, really good thing for us. Um, we've seen 
many more people, we're able to have more volunteers. Unfortunately, that also means we need more volunteers because there's more space to cover. But we serve, um, we serve about 1,200 households a week between our three programs. So we have a mobile pantry that we have a van that we put shelves of food on and coolers and produce. And we go out to 12 different sites within the community, mostly mobile home parks. Um, we also now are at Pheasant Ridge, which is a new pantry for us. Um, Capitol House Apartments and Ecumenical Towers. And we serve about 300 households a month through that program. And then our delivery program exploded, which I don't know what you were expecting, but we weren't expecting what we got. <laughs> so we, we do about 150 deliveries a week, which is, I, last month we did over 600 deliveries, which was our biggest month yet, I believe. Um, and then between 900 and 1,000 households in-house each week. So we're busy. We're very, very busy. And I do agree with John that the commodity foods that we see through the TFAP program are very important to us. Um, and we need to continue to, to receive those foods in order to do what we do. Um, those are the foods, since they're free to us, we don't have to limit those things as much to people that come into shop. So we take as much of that as we can um, so that we can give out as much as we can. Um, we also receive donations from table to table. Uh, we would not function the way we do without table to table's help in all aspects. So they're a great partnership for us. Um, we're starting to work more together as pantries, which I think is super fun and exciting. Um, and uh, with all of this that goes into it, we require 20 to 30 volunteers per day. So we don't only just see 180 to 200 households a day. We need to see lots of volunteers per day. We have eight staff in the building, and um, we're all divided up into programs. I have three in the food bank program, three in the mobile pantry program, warehouse coordinator, and myself. And there are days where it takes every single one of us to make things run, especially if we don't have enough volunteers. So our volunteers are our, our heart of our organization and how we run. And we've got wonderful volunteers, but there's always room for more. Um, and I anticipate that our clientele numbers are just going to keep increasing. Um, they've gone up by 3 to 5% every year that I've been here, and I've been here five years. So it's not going to go away. It's not going to stop. And the only thing we can do, the tourniquet was the perfect metaphor for it, because that's, that's what we're doing. So um, we just got to keep going. So donations, time. That's what we do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So my next question is for Rachel. Rachel, um, can you tell us about the, the need across our community? Um, why are we seeing such an increase in need? Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me OK? OK. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I uh, come from a pretty significant housing background, so I am going to talk a little bit about housing because the cost of housing in our community, uh, quite frankly, is out of control. So to afford a two-bedroom rental uh, in Johnson County, the housing wage is twenty-one sixty-seven an hour. Who knows what minimum wage is, right? So we're nowhere near um, being able to afford um, for folks who work service-related jobs, frontline jobs, no way can they afford housing. Most of the time, people prioritize their rent over food, right? If you are an adult and you have kids, you make sure your kids are fed first, you pay your rent, and you, and you guys know this uh, very well, people sacrifice their ability to eat to be able to make sure they have a roof over their head. Um, you know, I was talking with Crystal beforehand, and I, my, my kids ate all the groceries in the first two days of summer. Like, there, I have to go again. Like, I don't know why they ate like six yogurts in one day, and it's like, you know, it's funny, but it's also like, oh my gosh! Like, we all are feeling the impact of the price and cost of inflation in, at the grocery store. Um, and so, when we're looking at, you know, from a county level and a county perspective of how to infuse the community with funds which I'll talk about a little bit later in terms of different grant programs that we offer, um, we're really seeing that, that inflation and rise in housing costs that's really impacting households in our community. 
um, affordable housing is just not uh, really well uh, funded. We, we put as much money as we can as a community, but we need more of it. 55% um, of all renters in our community are cost burdened. And what that means is they are paying more than 30% of their income in rent. Um, so that's kind of the, the target target uh, amount of money to pay per month. So if you think about somebody who lives off of Social Security disability income, so let's say they make $1,000 a month, maybe, right? There are no rental units in our community that are $300 a month. That just doesn't exist. So you have people paying 50, 80, 90 percent of their income on rent to have a place to live and then have to come to places like community in the Coralville Food Pantry just to eat um, to survive through the day. Yes, and I, I bet some of you are wondering, like, why do we have somebody talking about housing when we're out of food insecurity? But it is definitely a web. And um, I know that we've all, I, I was mentioning the other day, I went to the grocery store, spent $170 on four bags of food. I, I can't even imagine if you're on a really tight budget trying to make those decisions. And that's what we're really here to talk about today, is how are you making those decisions and what programs um, and support services are you accessing to make sure that your family is fed, especially over these hungry summer months uh, when they don't have a limit to how much they, they can eat. So um, I, I just want to, Allison, I want to kind of have you chime in here from the school district perspective. Um, can you tell me what state and federal programs are available during the school year to help support students um, and what you do over the summer to, to bridge the gap? Sure. Good morning. Hope you can all hear me. Um, like my fellow panelists here, I'm pretty passionate about this, so you may have to cut off my mic like a presidential <laughs> debate if I carry on too long. Anyway. Um, so yes, during the school year, I think it kind of helps to understand the framework for child nutrition programs for school lunch. We are a federally funded USDA program. And so we get our financing largely through the federal government. So during the school year, families have to apply every year for free or reduced meal benefits. Um, those income guidelines change yearly, and so families have to reapply yearly. Um, it's great benefit. Um, the challenges that we face sometimes with that is this community is very diverse. English isn't the first language for a lot of our families, and so we really work hard throughout the district to educate families on that process. Um, this year, the income guidelines did widen a bit, so we have more folks qualifying, which is great news. Um, we just always have to encourage families to get out and, and apply. So, Free and reduced ben meal benefits are available during the school year for families. We also have a few other programs that help our families. Um, one is a, another grant through the USDA called our Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Grant. Um, for many years, this is my into my 12th year here at the school district, and for most of those years, we consistently have five schools that qualify. You have to, the school itself has to be greater than 50% free or reduced to qualify for some of these benefits. Um, you may remember probably 10 years ago when Steve Murley was still the superintendent, they did some changes with the boundaries for some of our different schools in the hopes to kind of even out some of those free and reduced numbers. And, and I always say that has been successful because this year I applied for 11 schools. 11 schools are now above that free and reduce, 50% free and reduced. So I think it also speaks to the need in the community. Um, when I started 12 years ago, we were at about 30 to 33% free and reduced as a community, and we are now 43% free and reduced as a community. Um, many of the federal programs have a 50% threshold, like you you have to be at least 50% free and reduced to qualify. So this Fresh Fruit and Veggie Grant, like I said, is a great program. It allows us to offer a fresh produce snack to children, usually mid-morning. Part of the idea behind that is when kids are hungry, they're more apt to try new things, and we have seen that to be true. Um, so that's been very successful. It's a nice supplement to those schools that need a little something mid-morning. Um, 
we also offer what we call universally free breakfast to again some of those schools uh, five currently that are really high free and reduced meaning regardless of what your status is free reduced or full priced you can show up for breakfast and eat um, if we learned anything from covid it is if you make the meals free they will come if you feed them, they will come. And I, that is my wish. I know I'm skipping ahead on the questions, but if I had my magic wand, I would definitely make all meals free to kids. Like, you know, I, I understand there's a price that goes along with that, but just like my own checkbook at home, like the government spends money on stupid stuff. Like let's spend our money in a little more positive way. Anyway, I digress. So we'll get back to that question. But um, so and as far as summer goes, the same, types of principles apply. These are federal programs we have to apply. To qualify, you have to be over 50% free and reduced. Um, I did apply for the nine part of that um, summer grant, and it was um, the, the criteria for uh, for receiving those grants um, largely was if you were a new site and rural, which um, doesn't really we were concerned that we wouldn't apply. We ended up, we did receive grant money and more than we had thought. What we were able to do with that was to have uh, a grab and go site. So Hills Elementary, that area is the only site in, John, in our school district that is considered rural. In a rural site, you can offer grab and go. So just like we did during COVID, families pull up, we hand them a bag of food, it's a breakfast and lunch, and away they go. It's fabulous. And um, we will be doing that this summer. It's at Hills, but it's not just for Hills kids. Anybody can come. The criteria is you have to be 18 years of age or younger, and you can drive up. We will distribute on Mondays and Wednesdays from noon to one, and so on Mondays we'll give two days worth of food, and on Wednesdays we'll give three days worth of food. One of the really awesome things about that is most of our summer programs, like we are partnering with John um, at the pantry to offer lunch, a few day, and an afternoon snack a few days a week and but you the federal government requires that you eat those meals on site that is problematic for some families if you've got parents that are working or you're not walkable it's it's hard to participate in some of these summer programs but this grab and go is huge like we served so many th you know we served well over a million grab and go meals during covid I always like to say when people went to the basement with their toilet paper, we went to the curb and handed out food. And um, we served a lot of food. <laughs> yeah, we served over um, like 1.2 million grab and go bags we served in that time period. Like we had staff that almost had like carpal yeah. symptoms because we turned into little factories in our kitchens bagging all that food. It was a good problem to have. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I'm super excited about this. We have no idea kind of what to expect, and so we're hoping to get some idea. We did get the word out. The, the district did release that email yesterday to families about it, but I just think we ought to continue to target that because I'm not sure people, A, will take the time to read it, or B, understand what that means. And so I would appreciate any help in spreading that word. We want families to come down and take advantage of those. Um, free meals. So you can also go to the district website to see what summer programs, other programs we have available. Like we have a morning snack at Weatherby. We have the lunches at um, the pantry here in Coralville. And then the, like the public library is doing an afternoon snack. And then the Antelope Lending Library also will be traveling throughout the community and offering snacks as well. So we just, we partner with these folks and we provide the food and get it ready. And then we submit those claims to get reimbursed through those federal funds so thank you yes thank you, you for that my I, mic. <laughs> look at that i know i'm picturing yeah. all those all that uh yeah a million that's amazing so um, thank you for talking about partnerships too I want to dive a little bit deeper into other partnerships so I'm going to turn it over to Crystal and John just to talk about um, how are you partnering to ensure that nobody is slipping through the cracks and um, maybe becoming a little bit more innovative in the process um, people have reached out to us Antelope Library reached out to us at the beginning of the year um, or 
spring in pre preparation for summer. So we have partnered with them as much as we can to provide snacks for the kids. Um, we partner with some of the school di the schools and provide snacks and such for the kids throughout the day. Um, Tate High School we partner with as well so that they have a pantry at their school. Um, people, we've gotten several requests for mobile pantry sites, uh, one in North Liberty, one in Corville. Um, so we're doing as much as we can to get out there and make sure people know we're here. One of the things that became really important, even more important, I guess, during COVID for me was to see um, that all populations were served, all econ economic statuses were served. We don't have a lot of barriers here when people come in. And I had several friends that were like, my kids ate everything in the first day. I don't know what to do. Then you come and see me at work. Like, come on in. Well, I make too much money, mm, but you don't. You're in need, and that's what matters. So trying to get the word out, taking the partnerships, working with the other pantries to collectively to make sure that things get taken care of and don't slip. Yeah, well said, Crystal. Um, I think for Coral Food Pantry, Allison mentioned uh, we have our summer lunch program. This will be our second year that we've we've done this um, at our new site, and that's definitely a public-private partnership with some incredible partners chipping in. Uh, the school district will prepare maybe a little more than half of all the meals that we'll distribute, and Allison mentioned they're reimbursed by the USDA for those those meals. Uh, the other meals will be provided by some of our wonderful restaurant partners in the community, ranging from you know Barrett's to Ponchero's. Uh, Big Grove, uh, and we have a team too of folks on our pantry staff and volunteers who will whip up some food occasionally, which is a lot of fun. We'll use some of the bulk food we get from table to table that maybe isn't as popular out in the pantry shopping, but we can whip up a tasty meal with it. Um, and then of course, uh, I also mentioned some of these fun engagement activities too. So we have everybody from the public library in Coralville to the Children's Museum, the Bike Library, Johnson County Conservation, all coming by to keep those kids engaged. And Because it is a challenge to get the kids to come, first of all. Um, and then while they're there, you want it to be a fun experience. You know, summer's meant to be a, a fun, restful time for kids, so to keep them engaged as well is important. Um, but otherwise, just this summer, I feel like we're all just trying to tread water, um, and there's partnerships that make that a little easier. I know Crystal shouted out Table to Table, our food bank, make it so much easier for us. Even though we are, like, running out of food at every shift, we have enough to get by, <laughs> thanks to them. Uh, other partnerships like Grow Johnson County, producing incredible high-quality produce that makes its way to the pantries is huge too. So those are the ones that come to mind. Well, thank you. So I, uh, I kind of have two final questions and then I'm going to you know, open it up to you all for questions. So start thinking about that. Uh, Rachel, you mentioned earlier um, that you had some grant money through the county. I just wanted to you know, ask what programs, projects, and grants are available through the county to help support this work? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm pr I am proud to say that a lot of the programs mentioned today, Johnson County does fund. Um, so uh, I'm going to rattle off a few uh, data points here just so you can uh, know how it, uh, important Johnson County views food insecurity. Um, so Veggie Connect uh, 2023 provided um, 11,500 pounds of food, um, so produce grown uh, by farmers in our community to over 140 households. Um, we recently awarded $94,000 to uh, various nonprofits for the hunger relief grant, so including uh, Mobile Pantry, the Coralville Summer Lunch Program. Um, and then we have, um, we also fund pantries uh, specifically through contracts, so over $100,000 go to all three pantries, um, divided out based upon a number of visits, uh, percentage-wise. We fund um, the community block grants, so $1.9 million are distributed to local nonprofits, not just food-related, but um, definitely uh, we have most of the pantries apply for those grants as well. Um, and then also, I can't remember who mentioned it, but the Johnson County Poor Farm um, is a huge huge contributor to um, food insecurity in our community. Okay, so John, I have, uh, I've given you the question of looking out into the horizon and telling me, telling us, what do you see, you know, coming in the next five to ten years that you all are going to need to, to find solutions for? Yeah. 
great question. I don't want to sound like too alarmist, and I want to stay positive too, but like it, there are things that certainly look bleak that we need to be aware of. Um, I think the biggest takeaway that I hope we all leave here is just this idea that hunger doesn't have to be a partisan issue, and I think it's proven it has, doesn't have to be, and it hasn't been historically. Uh, there's been a lot of bipartisan support around a lot of these solutions we've been talking about. Uh, but just thinking ahead, if there's not action from, you know, on, on the public safety net side to opt into a program like summer EBT, or if we keep chipping away at SNAP benefits, uh, that will directly impact families in our communities. It'll impact the pantries that are on the front lines. Um, we're going to need more summer lunch sites, which means, you know, more school districts will need supports to make those sites available. Uh, and again, it's a heavy lift, and that means more private dollars, United Way's working so hard, uh, and you all are giving so much of your time and resources to fund these programs, and it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, and I always point this out anytime we're in settings like this, but we in Johnson County are very rich in our uh, private resources, both as donors, volunteers, nonprofits, like United Way agencies are just full of incredible people who are working so hard to address so many issues. We still have some gaps, but we're pretty, we're pretty covered uh, compared to a lot of other communities. Um, but with that in mind, despite how well resourced we are, our organizations are struggling to, to meet up with, with this just explosion in need. And we can only consider how, how much of a struggle it is in other communities in Iowa, especially rural Iowa, where the majority of food pantries are run by volunteers who are, you know, described, they describe themselves as not spring chickens, like they've been around. It's hard work, and their volunteers there, the goodness of their heart, they're doing everything they can to keep up with the immense need, and it's not sustainable. So we need to return to a balance of public support. And again, we're so lucky to have our local governments supporting us in incredible ways, uh, but we need state and federal to chip in as well, too. Okay, and with that, who has a question? Oh, uh, yes, I'm on. Okay, it's actually two comments. Allison, you mentioned how the school yeah. meals, a lot of the sites, it's required to be in the congregate setting except for health. I do just want to point out, I do a lot of advocacy for kids with disabilities in Iowa City and in the state, and I did a lot of advocacy last year after hearing that a lot of kids, especially like autistic kids, weren't able to access meals in the congregate settings and they were being turned away, um, that accommodations can be made for children with disabilities, so if you know any families, you know, with autistic kids or kids with other disabilities, it's actually a requirement of the USDA that accommodations be made for them, that they can take their meals to go. They might have to provide proof of disability, though. <clears throat> Second of all, so many amazing summer and snack programs. I actually, did I say I'm Dina Bashar with Big Brothers Big Sisters? Sorry. I made um, some at a glance flyers of summer lunches and snacks because um, that information is avail available in different places but I wasn't seeing it like at a glance so I'll be sharing that on the Big Brothers Big Sisters Facebook page to be shared it's also on my personal Facebook page if you maybe some of you have seen it okay <laughs> um, which is actually a public post so you're welcome to go there and find it and share away and it just kind of lists all the lunch and snack um, locations for the summer as well as just all of the local food pantry and resources and a separate resource so those are my two comments thank you guys so much for your work Thank you. We might be stealing that for our, our shows. Could be full. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Krieger with Iowa City Hospice and VNA. And first, I think I might be reverberating here. <laughs> um, say thank you for what you guys do. We are seeing um, the rise in hunger because we're going out into the community and serving these people. And I'm really glad to hear about your delivery program. Even though it's really busy, it might get a little busier because these are people that can't get out. Um, so first, thank you. And second, I have um, two high school children who don't have enough to do this summer. So how can <laughs> high school kids help, um, one of which drives? Um, they're all getting out of school and happy to help. So. Um, we have, I can give you one of our business cards, and all they have to do is go to our website and sign up for volunteering, and then come to the shift. Um, they can help anywhere in the pantry uh, if the one who drives I need to check to see if there's an age limit I don't I think it is 18 for drivers but 
it is not for in-house. So we have lots of things that they can do. I love when teenagers come in. I love when children come in with their parents to educate and let them see um, this is not a scary thing to be here, but the concept is scary. But, but children need to be exposed to that. So bring them on in. We would love to see them. John, do you want to put a plug in for volunteers? Yeah, actually, I was talking to Allison about this. We usually see a dip in just our regular volunteer base during the summer, and it's supplemented by these amazing high school students who are either working towards their uh, silver cord community service hours. It's a great perk for them, but they just energize our atmosphere at the food pantry. We love them. So, yeah, send them to your local food pantry for sure. I agree. They're great yeah. to have. Yeah. Yes. And I also, on the other end of the spectrum, I want to put in a plug for our AmeriCorps 55 Plus uh, RSVP program. And Wendy it would be happy to talk with you about that. But that's our senior core of volunteers um, that United Way uh, hosts out of our office. So if you know of someone that would qualify on the other end of the spectrum from teenagers and maybe has a little time to volunteer in the community, um, Wendy also is in charge of our volunteer hub so she has lots of different resources available um, if you're interested in volunteering so who has another question does my staff have questions you guys okay well I one of the things that I oh Christy huh? oh I don't have to stand. Hey there, guys. How you doing? Hey. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that um, I'm with the Domestic Violence Intervention Program, and these partners are stunning. If you, I'm, I know you know it. I know you know it. So one of the things we always talk about is, is what is the today question and what is the tomorrow question? If I had to ask you for three, th three things that you really struggle to get met today, what would it be? and then one collaboration that you think would really make a difference in the community that maybe we aren't wrapping our heads around yet. I hope those questions are not like, oh crap. <laughs> but that's kind of where I start. What is the today, what is the tomorrow? So. Yeah, that's a good one. John, you look like you, oh, go ahead, Alex. I don't know. So <laughs> things that we struggle with currently, um, Again, if I had a magic wand, um, I would love that we would have more summer sites throughout the community. And to do that, we would need more sponsors like the Coralville Food Pantry. I can provide the food, but it's nice to have walkable locations throughout the entire community where, again, it is hard to get kids motivated to come to some of these sites. So my, t my wishes would be for more sites throughout the community and for the guidelines to change so kids could take that food off site. I think that would be huge for our families and would, would better fill that gap left from the EBT cards. Um, because, and I think that's why the, some of the rural areas struggle. They don't have the ability to provide these summer sites. And why Nebraska flipped and turned back on the EBT cards was because they have such large rural areas. I think their folks just said, now listen, we, you know, even if there was a summer site, nobody's driving, can't afford to drive, or parents are working, you can't get to the sites to pick up the food. And so I just think that would be a, an amazing thing. And if, and that would be the now question. And then again, for the future, I just think, when we saw all barriers removed to meals during COVID, it just made a huge difference. And you know, we can provide two thirds of a, of a child's needs during the school year, and that's huge. And that would help all of our partners here, and take the burden off families in that way. Um, I think that would be huge. And some states have filled that gap and are making meals free. Um, Iowa has not done that. I said, even if they could do breakfast, breakfast would be huge. It would be a smaller price tag. And again, we just need to work on that commodity angle because we, we do utilize a lot of commodities too in our school nutrition programs. And um, that's a win-win in my opinion for farmers and for Iowa, as well as for our students. So that would be my future wish. 
I'll just add, I mentioned earlier the county um, had awarded the hunger relief grant. There was about $94,000 available. We had over $250,000 in application. So if that tells you a need from our community partners, Quite frankly, we need funding. We need funding to be able to feed our community. Um, and these lovely uh, people who do this hard work need your support. I'll just add, yeah, the funding, and then that trickles down to we need food. Like Crystal and I have been yeah. talking back and forth. Literally, our shelves are running out of food at the end of every shift. And funds make that happen, uh, new food sources, collaborations. So the collaboration that can happen is we've already done a little bit of this, but we can do more. The pantries collaborating on wholesale purchases where we can get more bang for a buck. Uh, we've done that in the past. There's opportunity for that in the future, too. So there's sometimes in these moments of crisis, we just have to react and collaborate in innovative ways, and that will certainly happen. Um, but I will definitely Definitely second Allison's call for a healthy school meals for all bill, whether it's lunch or breakfast, that would make a huge impact, certainly. Agreed. Um, yeah, so what John had said earlier is that by the end of the shift, our food is gone. And we've often joked uh, in our building that we should take photos at the beginning of the day and the end of the day because yeah. it's very different. So yes, funding and food, um, definitely. All right. Any Final questions. Well, with that, oh, go ahead. Yes, here. It's just a minor question, but it has to do with, um, with, with fresh food. And when I volunteered here a while ago, it seemed like somebody was bringing in a truckload of stuff from, from the auctions in Kelowna. Is that still happening? Because if it's not, it seems like that would be a really fun project for several people to do. I mean, you could have people go to the auctions. You could have people bring this stuff up. I mean, and I think that would be fun to do. It is still happening. Um, it did not for a couple of years. The donors had some um, personal stuff going on and weren't able to do it. But um, they did do it last year. Um, and I'm hoping that we see that again this year. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well with that, I um, am so appreciative of all of you in this room today taking this information back and really sharing it with the people in your lives. That's one way that you can help um, help kind of solve this problem in our community is just spreading the word, talking about this issue. Um, like I said earlier, we've got three requests from you. We ask you to volunteer, we ask you to advocate, and we ask you to donate. So um, many of you in here are already uh, faithful donors of the causes um, and the issues uh, surrounding food insecurity and just um, how expensive it is to be in our community. Um, but we do have, like I mentioned, we have the RSVP program over here. I would love for you to have some time after this event to connect uh, with the individuals that are here. I also want to mention that Ryan Bobbs from the North Liberty Food Pantry is here. We've got representatives from Hey cap here. Um, so please just connect um, with folks. We've still got plenty of coffee um, and, and danishes over there. So please just connect and have a conversation um, about this really important issue. So as we close, I just want to thank each one of you for being here today and for the work that you do and also just uh, giving us all of this really important information. Um, it's just critical, the work that you do, and we're so appreciative of that.